among the largest and oldest living things on earth. They inspire awe and wonder to anyone that has walked beside them. Some of them would have already been 200 to 300 years old when the Roman Empire was at its pinnacle. They are giant sequoias, the guardians of the Sierra Nevada forest. These sentinels scattered throughout groves in the western United States have survived centuries of disease and insects, but currently they face a challenge that could wipe them off the planet. Heat, drought, and extreme wildfire have coalesced in recent years and now pose an existential threat to these majestic giants. The giant sequoias as a species we know have a long history with, with fire. In fact, they are a fire dependent species. They are dependent on fire to roll through every so often, clean out the forest floor, and to, uh, for the heat to rise up into the canopies and to create that seed rain in order to produce the next generation of, of sequoias. So with a sequoia that uh, grows to maturity and is 1,000, 2,000, 2,500 years old, they have been exposed uh, over the millennia to fire dozens, if not hundreds of times in their, in their lifespans and they are designed to withstand fire as long as it is low to moderate intensity fire. Trees that have been killed in mass by high intensity fire is almost unheard of across the record and the consequence of this combination of drought that with uh, climate change driven droughts that are burning hotter, drier, and more frequently than in the past, combined with the heavy accumulations of both living and dead forest fuels. And that has created this deadly uh, combination for the giant sequoias. In 2020, the Castle Fire burned through a large number, over 20 different giant sequoia groves. And while that fire was burning, chunks of giant sequoia foliage that used to be 100 to 200 feet in the canopy were falling in people's yards in Three Rivers, California, outside Sequoia National Park. At that time, I talked to our superintendent, we talked to the regional director, we said, sequoias are dying in numbers never seen before. We need a call to action. We need to talk about the scope of the problem get public support for the solution and start working together to implement solutions as quickly as possible. And that was the birth of the Giant Sequoia Lands Coalition. The coalition is all Sequoia land managers, all 11, working together throughout the state of California. It's State of California, National Park Service, Forest Service, University of California, County Parks, all these different groups, Tulare uh, County Fire, uh, Tule River Tribe working together to understand what condition our groves in, what treatments do they need, and how do we help the public understand good fire and bad fire and how to keep these beautiful forests into the future. Several agencies declared an emergency and did a lot of fuel reduction work in response to that emergency. The BLM, where we're standing right now, they had this amazing project that was working on thinning and pile burning and reducing fuels in, that, in these groves on this land. We have uh, burnt and treated in the last uh, two years, um, roughly 726 acres of piles have been treated, specifically around and isolated to uh, around the drip line in the groves proper in the project area. We've worked and partnered with uh, the Tulare County RCD and the Tulare unit um, CAL FIRE to conduct mastication uh, in and around uh, high risk areas that would hopefully slow or impede catastrophic wildland fire impacts on the sequoia groves. Those treatments have definitely contributed to the success of, especially uh, considering the intensity at which the fire came through the groves, we're looking at pretty high survivability in the groves. The groves involved in this fire have different histories and that affects how fire behaves in them. So. 
one of the Park Service groves that has fire in it right now. It's a little bit of smoke. You could see the green tree tops, perfect. That grove is called Eden Creek Grove. And in 2018, we managed a wildfire in that grove. And that fire reduced fuel loading in that grove and meant that as this fire burned in there, the firefighting team with the advice of experts from the Giant Sequoia Lands Coalition, Sequoia experts, was able to put back fire in that grove and the fuels were low, low enough that we expect really good fire in that grove. Good for the sequoias, good for community safety, more burned ground between the forest and the community. When the coffee pot fire began on August 3rd, 2024, the need for an incident management team was recognized due to the complexity of the emerging incident. In addition to many of the normal objectives of managing large-scale, complex fires, the teams immediately recognized the unique circumstances presented by the sequoia tree groves. They went to work with the National Park Service and the Bureau of Land Management to determine the best, safest, and most efficient actions to try to protect the groves. It kind of struck the team early on that uh, in the last four or five years, our agency administrator Clay Jordan had mentioned that over 20% of the groves had experienced fatalities. We've lost 20% of the sequoias due to the KMP complex and several other fires that we had had up in that area. And that really resonated with me that in five years for a 2,000 to 3,000 year old tree, we had lost that many of them. So what strategies are there to save them? We had come up with a few of them. One was early on, any of the firing operations that we were gonna do in and around the groves would have to be really calculated so that we weren't bringing fire from the bottom to the top and introducing high intensity fire into the grove, which damages the canopy. We had some very deliberate firing opportunities in some of the groves that brought fire from top to bottom slowly while we had crews there to keep low intensity fire in the grove, which we know the sequoias can survive that, yet not you know, bring high intensity fire into the crown, which would typically kill the tree. So other things that we had heard from the resource advisors, which we met with every single evening, is if you could get in after a high intensity fire and cool the root systems, you increase the survivability of the trees. And we had never done this or heard of this. So immediately we got with operations and we spent quite a bit of time putting some type six engines, some of our smaller apparatus into the groves to literally water the root systems of these giant trees in hopes that we could save them by cooling the roots. We are able to um take advantage of a natural started wildfire and with the support of um, the incident management team to help the land managers um, meet their objectives and the incident management team meet their objectives. It's, it's this tough terrain up here to control fire. Um, it's hard to get lines in and it's hard to contain and so with the act of defensive burning we we're able to um, ecologically meet objectives while also meeting our safety objectives and protecting the community of Three Rivers. Um, and because of the active management we did, because of the mastication, we are super excited with how this grove looks. The work primarily is getting fuels away from the base of the tree and pull stuff away from the drip line, stuff that's going to get up, you know, torch into the canopy. Um, and so, I, you know, from a, my perspective, that work is, yeah, absolutely effective um, on, a, on a small scale. You can't do grove wide, right? But you can go in and do individual point protection on a monarch similar that you would do a like point protection of a structure, you know, almost think of it as, a, as a defensible space standard for a, for a monarch tree. If we are um, essentially doing thinning with fire, right? Killing the, the competing species, killing the shade tolerant species, then that, um, those fuels don't build up, or, up over time. You don't have what they call the ladder fuels or the uh, and you don't have the density of those fuels. So if the, if the ladders are gone, then not, the fire's not gonna get up into the canopy. And if the density is gone, then they won't run through the crowns of those fires. And the idea is that it stays on the ground, basically uh, low to moderate intensity surface fire, limit scorching to the trees, limit torching of the trees. Um, and it's certainly much more manageable if you had to suppress it, you could get in there and do it on a direct attack and you have a smaller fire footprint. And then if you, could, if you have to manage it or do a different strategy, the 
the effect on the larger landscape is, is just, you know, much less. With the uh, IMTs and, and uh, uh, with the coffee pot fire, we established protection of the sequoias as one of the highest priorities, right behind firefighter safety, right behind protection of the, of the community, uh, then it became a really high priority. And in order to set up the team for success, we infused a number of sequoia conservation protection subject matter experts that uh, uh, have tremendous knowledge about sequoia ecology, but also have the experience of working through the, these previous fires. Um, so uh, we brought in folks from, uh, from Yosemite and from the state and from the Forest Service and from the Save the Redwoods League as this think tank to help develop mitigations that were customized for each, each grove. Active fire management isn't new to the National Park Service. In fact, it's been in action for quite some time and has been successful in several park units, including one that is very similar to Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks in regards to its unique resources. Resource advisor Garrett Dickman explains the similarities of the 2022 Washburn Fire in Yosemite National Park to the 2024 Coffee Pot Fire in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Parks. The Washburn fire started just outside the Mariposa Grove and ran immediately into the grove. And we had to evacuate about 500 people out of buses to get them out of the grove so we could start doing suppression activities to try to protect the Mariposa Grove of giant sequoias. So that fire was, as it was running in the grove, it slowed down because for the past 50 years, we've been doing prescribed fire treatments. And as that fire was backing towards the community of Wawona, not far from the Mariposa Grove, Flame lengths were a couple hundred feet tall. And as it hit the Wawona Road, which connects the grove and the community, those flame lengths dropped to a couple feet, to inches, to going out. Because two years prior, we had done a mechanical fuels reduction project to remove those fuels. In any fire, life and property is gonna be the first priority, even for trees that have lived for thousands of years. And during the Washburn fire, we didn't have to choose between a community and a grove, we gotta choose both. These treatments work. And we've been trying to apply that on a larger scale. And the Washburn fire was a really great proof of concept that this works. This can really work to both protect the giant sequoias, but also to protect firefighters and make sure they, ha they can feel safe while they're doing these operations. Until experts conclude their post-fire analysis, we won't know the actual extent of loss from the coffee pot fire in the park and BLM groves. However, we can say that the coalition and partnerships developed since the devastating fires in the early 2020s is working. The Giant Sequoia Lands Coalition was developed to unify Giant Sequoia managers um, and researchers, stakeholders, tribal members, everyone who has input and a stake in how we're managing giant sequoias and what's best for giant sequoias as a whole um, has been brought together under this coalition where we're sharing resources. We're talking about the newest research um, for replanting sequoias, for monitoring sequoias after fire, for um, bark beetle impacts to these giant sequoias. And we're also networking where I saw a huge success on this fire because of the work that the coalition has done in the last several years to bring us all together multiple times a year where I saw names that I recognize and I know like, oh, we're in good hands because there's other giant sequoia people here. Um, uh, the Giant Sequoia Lands Coalition has been a huge part of the success of this fire. An integral part of the Giant Sequoia Lands Coalition is the partnership with local tribal nations. We're in a sacred place of my people and the tribes here. We consider this as an area where we used to bury our, our, uh, our headmen, our chiefs. It's appropriate place, very sacred. And therefore, what we're caring for in a good way, it helps carry on that confidence that our tribal people have in working with the federal, state, local government partners in a good way. We value these relationships 
with the federal and state local government folks, the Forest Service, Park Service, CAL FIRE, and the tribes, they're, they're continually wanting to build upon these. And for me, being here as a fire tribal liaison, whatever I can do to help strengthen those, I will. It's an honor to, to work with and to, to represent uh, the tribes, my people, and with the, the tribal connection and everything, we're gonna work together with our, our partners and, and do it in a good way and uh, make, a, make an impact. There's a lot of cultural resources in this area and then when, when I walk through here, I feel bad when I see some, that, these, some of these Guardians, you know, didn't make it, but the, the little ones, they'll come back, and the ones that are standing, they're resilient and strong, similar to the spirit of our people. We're not extinct. We're alive and, and vibrant, and we'll do everything we can to, to work with the forces here to bring it back and, uh, you know, do, do everything we can to be a part of it and bring our people back up and show them the good work that we've been doing. People are part of this landscape, and we have a sacred connection to these forests and have an obligation to continue to engage with them and manage them and work in partnership with nature and wildfire to make sure that they're healthy and resilient going forward into the future for many, many generations to come, just like these trees have been standing here for so many generations before us. The actions that we take or fail to take can have a thousand, two thousand years worth of consequence. And that's what the GSLC is all about, about trying to take actions now that has a positive consequence um, over the next couple of thousand years, as opposed to inaction that could have a negative consequence for an extended period of, of time. The giant sequoia is an icon of climate change that it opens the door for us to kind of talk about uh, beneficial fire on the landscape, uh, about fire resilient forests that go well beyond the, the groves, and about the, the benefits of low and moderate intensity fire and restoring natural fire processes on the landscape, and then ultimately about climate change itself and the impacts that it's having in, in the Sierra Nevada. We need to treat what's happening in giant sequoias as the emergency that it is. We need to treat the, what's happening to the forest across the West as the emergency it is and take action now because we have a choice. And if we take that choice to take action, we can leave behind and to future generations these trees that have been left behind for us. I kind of think of giant sequoias as this gift that gets passed down from generation to generation. And if we want to pass these gifts that we got, these giant sequoias, these things that make you think about your place and time and size and just the sense of awe and people all around the world get from seeing these trees, we need to do something to make sure that we can pass that gift forward. It's not going to happen all on its own. We are, we are part of the giant sequoia history and we need to continue that into the future.